we're at an important historic moment in the field of youth development. Schools, as you know, have been required to focus in more narrowly on math, science, cognitive skills, yet recent studies show that social-emotional learning skills are as important as cognitive skills in predicting future career success, adult relationships, mental health. At the same time, high quality studies, and there's a, a recent definitive review, shows that participation in after school programs significantly increases young people's social emotional skills. Furthermore, in a study of 19 high schools that we did, students reported much more frequent social-emotional learning experiences in programs than they do in school classrooms. So social-emotional learning is hot and we're in the right place at the right time. Um, there's an opportunity for us actually to be embraced for what we do well. Um, but to really seize the moment, we need to be able to articulate as even better maybe than we do, um, what SEL skills are, which is a pretty hard task, um, and what do we do that is most effective in facilitating this learning. So for the last, uh, you know, I was, had the good fortune for the last 15 years, um, these are exactly the questions um, that our research team, including Kate, and more recently Natalie and Lisa, have been working on. We've studied over 40 high quality arts, technology, and leadership programs for high school age youth, really in depth, as Kate said, where we're interviewing people over time, um, conducting over 1,500 interviews, um, and learning both about how youth learn skills and how staff support those learning processes. And in, a dozen, in dozens of published articles, we'd very carefully documented what we've learned, and in that process we've kind of brought in our contribution is partly just to pull together what you all know um, from your daily work, because we were interviewing you and your youth, um, but then also to bring in the literature and decades of research on emotion, on motivation, on human development to, to try and synthesize those two. Um, so, what it, in the heck is social emotional learning? Um, we've, what we've learned is that it's a lot different from cognitive school learning. I'm not sure you can test it very well with a multiple choice question. Um, for one thing, youth from different upbringings um, may have equally effective different solutions to the same situation. Okay, there's not necessarily one right social emotional way to act for every situation. Culture enters in, personality enters in, the situations are very complex. In addition to that, the stuff of social emotional learning is um, deep, uh, powerful, sometimes quite personal. It entails your own values, personal feelings, vulnerabilities, who you are and what you care about. So this is really loaded stuff. Furthermore, um, the stuff of social emotional learning to youth is often pretty complicated, disorderly, counterintuitive, messy, strange, weird, random, sketchy. You probably have your own words for this. Um, but you're going to hear those words a lot, and that's kind of the meaning of the, of the slide, the picture over there. Um, let me just give you some examples. Um, uh, your brain and feelings can play tricks on you. Um, motivation can be strong one day and gone the next. Um, this youth, Jeff, said, when you first start a project, you have all these ideas, and once you do it, all those ideas just disappear and you're left with nothing. Um, strange, weird, counterintuitive, and so these are some of the kind of problems I'm, we're gonna talk about today as social-emotional learning challenges. It's like the problems you have to 
learn to solve, not that those of us as, of, as adults have solved all these, but at least we've made progress. Um, there are problems and puzzles. And some people think of social emotional learning as about the self. You know, when you have people talk about it, they often talk about self-regulation. But social emotional learning is inextricably connected to people's interactions with the external world, with the real world, which is also complicated and can be pretty strange and weird, right? Um, just for example, you know, the dynamics of human relationships, these kind of times get really complicated, right? Um, and disorderly, uh, miscommunication, um, group dynamics, the challenges of doing good work, um, trying to reach a goal, you know, if your project, Murphy's Law comes in, you know, if anything can go wrong, it will. Um, just lots of twists and turns we'll be talking about. And then, of course, there's the catch-22s, contradictions, and injustices of societal institutions. So this is hard stuff. It's hard stuff for kids. It's hard stuff for some of us in our own lives. Um, and the challenges of social-emotional learning involve starting to figure out and develop strategies to navigate this powerful, important, and strange dynamics of both the human mind and simultaneously of human relationships, work, and living in society. So the problems you have to figure out are more like story problems, but they're story problems you're living at the moment. So you're invested. And so our message today is that However, that as you figure out and start to create order within what has seemed random, bizarre, complicated, and disorderly, they become empowered in manifold new ways throughout every part of their life. Um, so this, that's why social emotional learning is so powerful because it reaches across all areas of your life. Once you can see what those emotions are doing to you, or at least have a handle on what they might be doing, uh, it empowers you, it empowers young people. So um, in the first half of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the nature of these social emotional learning challenges. Um, and I'm gonna try and cover six domains um, of challenges. These are uh, emerged from our research. They're also the focus of uh, an ongoing, really important social emotional learning collaboration between the Susan Crown Exchange, the Weikert Center, myself, and staff from eight like really excellent programs um, across the country. I'll say more about that later. Um, if you like acronyms, we can reorganize this into Get Real. Um, and so uh, another central point we're gonna make and, and from our findings, is the programs provide powerful conditions for youth to learn these skills, really optimal conditions. Youth are engaged in real world, um, problem-based and project-based learning. They become highly invested. It's important to them. It has meaning. Um, the work confronts them with real world complexity and messiness, um, but then, um, including SEL challenges, but this happens within a safe context in which they have trusting relationships with caring staff, and staff are able to be intentional, although it's not easy, and we'll talk about that skill, in supporting youth SEL learning. So the first half of my comments today are gonna to be about the nature of those challenges, and um, then in the second half, I'm gonna bring in the role of adults um, and really talk about how do youth learn those skills. I'm gonna focus on one skill domain, responsibility. And then after that, uh, Natalie's gonna talk about learning emotion skills and the role of leaders in doing that. And um, after that, uh, Nat uh, Lisa is, a, is an expert on program design in her previous life, and so she's gonna talk some about program design or some aspects or get us talking about program design and how that can make a difference. So the goal for today is engaging you in whatever way we can 
in thinking creatively about your work with youth um, within the framework of Cell, and uh, we'd love to have one-to-one -one conversations with all of you, but we can't, so um, we'll try and do that uh, from the podium and through the discussion groups. Um, let me just mention that every program is different, um, and some programs choose to focus more on one domain than another, one skill set. Um, it's pretty hard to do all six of those skill sets at once. And let me also just apologize a little bit that we're going to focus our research is mainly on high school age youth. Those of you who are working with programs for younger youth, I think you'll be able to translate what we say. But in the discussion uh, period, if you want to come back to that, it would be really interesting to say, well, how does this apply for younger kids? Um, okay, so let's talk about those learning challenges and how they differ across these different domains. And so we'll start with emotions, and uh, Natalie's going to talk more about this, but I'm going to start with this cartoon. Son, this is the barn where you, we keep our feelings. If you have a feeling, lock it in here. Now, I can identify with this because my dad grew up on a farm, but notice this, this dad is actually doing more than some fathers do and acknowledges that we have feelings. Um, and part of the reason emotions can be difficult is they're not talked about. Um, uh, and they're, they're not something you can just see right away. They're abstract. You can't directly see emotions. You need to detect them from indirect cues like, my throat is tight, or I want to kill this person. <laughs> um, and research shows that if emotions, if youth aren't exposed to a lot of discussion about emotions, they don't develop those skills to identify emotions. They just think the person did something bad <laughs> and they deserve to be killed. Um, so, and this is also important because emotions, including positive emotions like excitement and love, can have profound effects on our very being at that moment in time. Um, so, uh, you know, they can take over the brain like a fever. Uh, so let me talk about emotions in this one theater program. Um, Dawn, the stage manager, said, that choreographer is a big challenge. I just want to go up there and give him a piece of my mind. Cody, an actor, said, when people got angry, other people got angry. Everybody is just psycho. So it's not just emotions in individuals, it's emotions in groups. And um, uh, part of the point is that emotions can really mess with you. They can distort your thinking, deal, der dis derail your effort, disrupt work, and sometimes make you do things that you later say, oh my God, I wish I didn't do that. Um, and if teens don't learn to identify, understand, and be comfortable with the strange dynamics of emotions, they can create blind spots and become scary and shameful, and then people avoid them at all costs. I'm not going to try that. I'll mess up. I can't give this speech. I'll die. And that's the worst thing when you're, you're so, emotions are so far away that you just like avoid them. You try and do everything to avoid them. Um, um, but the other side of the coin here is that, and Natalie will talk more about this, is that emotions are really put there for a reason. They can, they can help focus our attention, they can motivate us, and if we listen really closely, they give us a lot of valuable information about a situation, decision, or people. They can help us detect what's fake and what's real, what matters and what doesn't. So emotions can be weird, but they're also really powerful if you make friends with them. Even doubt, worry, excitement can be cues to the order within that complicated order that you're starting to struggle with um, as a growing child. And research shows that whether and how teens learn to address emotion, emotional challenges is really significant to their adult well-being. And coming back to all of us, the important issue is that for you as youth professional, those emotional experiences, which arise all the time, provide learning opportunities. 
their chances for youth to learn because they're in a safe environment. They're in an environment where emotions can be discussed. Um, and again, Natalie will be talking about this. So you might notice that, that these last two examples, let me go back, um, involve other people. A lot of emotions involve other people. And um, in fact, um, these six different domains are all interrelated with each other. So emotional learning and learning empathy tend to go hand in hand. Learning to understand others is, is helped by understanding yourself. Um, so that's another complexity is that in given situations, a lot of these will, will interact. So um, let me, uh, so we'll talk about empathy and, and understanding difference. And let me start by saying every blue ribbon panel or panel on 21st century skills includes empathy and abilities to understand and empathize with others, including people from different cultures, religions, sexual identities and abilities as just a vital skill to our society. I mean, look at the world around us in our shrinking globe this is essential to the planet's future, that we become able to broaden the circle to see other people. And now the human sciences suggest on the one hand that we're born a bit egocentric, um, but also that we have inbuilt tendency to be social, to empathize. Um, but the important thing about human development is there's a lot of different dispositions you have and with our large brain, you have the opportunity either to develop those or not. Um, so we, youth programs, the adolescent period is an important time for kids to expand that circle, to develop that capability. Um, in fact, adolescents can, the teen years can be a, a turning point in terms of empathy development. On the one hand, youth have new capacities to really see inside other people, to really feel other people's feelings in a way that children don't um, and predict what their feelings are. But at the same time, the teenage years are a time when in-group, out-group behavior intensifies. Many youth become involved in fewer, not more, cross-group relationships. And some youth become more likely to engage in discriminatory behavior, including hate crimes. Um, so here are some statements by members of a Chicago program called Youth Action. Actually, these are all pseudonyms. Um, Jamalia, an African American, said, before I got here, I ain't talked to nobody out of my race. I used to just blow them off and pay no attention to them. Donato, a Latino, said, I used to be a pretty big jerk to people that, that were different from me. I would make a bunch of like horrible racial slurs and stuff like that. And he went on, and I had to edit what he said after that. Um, but um, for balance, let me add myself to this equation. Um, as a guy growing up in Falcon Heights and Roseville, I had no idea that my female friends were experienced high rates of sexual abuse and harassment. Um, and you know, in the 70s, the experience of GLBT, people were certainly locked in the barn. Um, as a result, there were huge, whoops, sorry, I gotta get the picture up here. Um, there were huge blind spots in my ability to understand and empathize with uh, many of the people around me. Um, and research shows that people with power and privilege, like myself, and, and, and even more privileged now, white, middle class, male, straight, um, experience stronger challenges to understanding and empathizing with people who are different from ourselves, partly because we don't have access to the information. People don't tell us. They tell us what they want to hear or it's kept from us by the media, certain things the media doesn't put up there, and also by our peers, our families, and also because in many cases we don't have any reason to seek it out. I'm just perfectly happy being you know, treated the way I am. So here are a few more quotes. Um, and let me just skip to that second one. My feeling regarding culture, family background, and all that stuff, I don't believe all this BS. I believe you're a human being, I'm a human being. Now these quotes are not from Minnesotans. Um, they happen to be program leaders. 
um, when we ask them direct questions. And so this is very relevant to youth programs. Programs, as I've said earlier, are uniquely positioned to be safe, um, friendly context for uh, youth to learn all SEL skills, including empathy, um, but not if staff are unsupportive, and that includes administrators. Um, uh, it really makes a huge difference. Youth action, uh, however, was intentional in helping youth develop this important SEL skill set. They watched films, they had guests from different backgrounds, they collaborated with other programs, and that provided structured opportunities for empathy development. Furthermore, the leader, Jason, was also skillful at using the situations that arose in their daily events and their activities um, to create discussions about difference. And um, so some of their youth, um, you know, Donato said, had learned it's, it's, let me find my notes, it's only like the exterior stuff, but on the inside, it's really all the same people. So that was a, a step, but a little bit later, he learned going down to the bottom um, to really change his own behavior and to be an active listener. You know, he's the one who talked about those racial slurs. I used to think it uh, didn't, it, the one harmless joke couldn't hurt, but man, this is really serious. Youth action taught me to give other people a chance to listen to what they say. And these youth got a lot further than I did at that age. Um, and the message here and from the research is that to support um, empathy development, um, hi Joyce. <laughs> um, to support empathy development, youth need to learn to be active listeners and proactive in, and the same is true for leaders. Um, you know, that you can't just say everybody's different, you need to stand up for kids who are getting discriminated against, you need to create opportunities for everybody to get their voices heard, you need to create a safe environment for everybody. There's a lot of research that Prejudice becomes very inborn and becomes hidden because it's so unconscious, but there's also evidence under the right conditions people can overcome and really start to see the humanity in people uh, beyond them as well as check their own, their own uh, biases. So these are tough challenges for staff and programs to take on, and I think researchers could do a lot to help kind of open the barn on this. Um, we're studying programs that are effective, we have some programs in the Susan Crown Exchange who do exceedingly well at uh, helping youth uh, take on these learning challenges. Um, but there's a lot to be done there. Okay, so on to teamwork. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, teamwork is related to empathy, but it's about skills for working in groups, group collaborations, I'll bet if we talked in the group, you've all had some experiences, some good stories about collaborations that go wrong. Um, and the challenges youth report in learning teamwork includes all different kinds of strange dynamics. You know, double traps, vicious cycles. Um, here are just some uh, examples. You know, this uh, uh, Joaquin, you know, wouldn't trust anybody just because he'd been burned so many times. Rogelio and lots of youth really have a hard time taking feedback from peers. Um, Jamie, I have dates to get this stuff in and if they're busy, I'm gonna be like, oh crap. Um, you know, and then there's the slackers, the know-it-alls, no-shows, bossy pantses. There's a whole set of kind of classic issues and groups kids to learn, need to learn about. Um, all of these, again, are real-time opportunities for staff to make a difference. Um, the other side is that there's all those positive things about learning to be a group that can really be important. We know from research that effective teams, um, as compared to people working alone, can solve problems better. Um, they draw on, um, they pool their memories, they are better at retrieving information, they're more reliable and consistent, and they often solve things. And I think this is something we do really well from my studies of programs. This is kind of like a, I don't know if hidden weapon is the right word, but 
it's one of our underappreciated strengths is that we're very good at teaching youth to work in teams which they don't learn much anywhere else and, and really kind of work through those negatives and also really optimize these kind of things. Um, let me go on then to action skills. And um, by action skills, we mean uh, skills for working toward goals in complex, messy, real world context, abilities to take action, skills for planning, strategizing, implementing, adjusting, managing uncertainty. Children can do this and uh, children can do a little bit of planning, but they have kind of magical thinking. When my son was about seven, he'd do a drawing of a flying car for me. And he was so excited, Dad, a flying car. And I said, well, how do you make it fly? And he says, oh, well, there's a button right there on the board, and you push it. Um, it's only in adolescence you begin to see that getting from point A to point B, especially in world things, real world situations, is a lot more complicated uh, than you can imagine. It involves a lot of nuance if you're working with teaching younger children or you're tr trying to lobby a school board or just make a work of art that will be effective. Um, things are going to go wrong. Murphy's Law. Um, Maria at El Canchillo had experience with a principal withdrawing permission to use the space at the last hour. Um, and she provided this great description of the challenges of actions. We can't do this. We have this, this, and this. So we have to find other ways to solve the problems. Um, and of course, uh, there's a lot of people skills involved too. How to keep discussions going. You know, Murphy's Law, you think you can teach something somebody, but then when you actually get down to it, it's not as easy. The magical thinking is still there. Uh, you know, adults can be charismatic, but phony. Um, just a lot of things you have to learn um, to get there. And uh, our, our data suggests this, uh, that skill set builds a lot on adolescents' new capacities for executive thinking, made possible by changes in the adolescent brain. Um, and again, once, and you've probably seen this, once you start to learn that, hey, we can do a meeting, we can organize an event, we can lobby a school board, we can make a great work of art, um, it's very empowering. You know, if you don't have that skill, you feel really disempowered, um, but, but uh, teens and programs have that great experience. Okay, I'm going to skip over responsibility because we're going to get to that. And um, just very quickly on motivation, another really challenging, complicated topic, both for us as leaders, like, you know, there's those days where how do we get kids motivated, but also for youth. Um, and many, many things can contribute to motivation. When I was an undergrad at the U, there was already like hundreds of theories of motivation, each with their own kind of piece of truth. And then there's also like many, many things that can stop motivation. So it's like a really complicated problem that might differ for different teens. Um, here are just some of the challenges. I'm not getting bored. We've been procrastinating spring hits. Um, that last one, we, we have to push ourselves instead of like an outside force coming in. And I really like that last one because, you know, a lot of youth leaders are really good at kind of just pumping kids up. But ultimately, we need them to sustain their own motivation. They need to develop grit. They need to develop, as with emotions, kind of skills to understand how motivation works. There are patterns there. Um, there's a lot of theory. And uh, kids need to start figuring out the craziness of that. We tried to talk to them about boredom. They like couldn't talk about boredom at all. Boredom was like really in the barn. <laughs> um, so just to summarize, you know, the, we, we've talked about six domains. They're all connected, um, and which makes it harder. Um, and each of them present a different kind of strangeness and um, difficulty to, to get through. Um, and they're also about things that are deeply personal often. Um, let's see where I am in my notes. They're intertwined, or they involve deep and personal issues. 
things you care about, ranging from values, lack of knowledge, and feelings of person uh, vulnerability and helplessness. Um, but, again, there's much empowerment to be gained as you start to understand, get the stuff out of the barn, develop skills to learn to navigate these challenges. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch to how, how this learning takes place and um, you know, given that it's complicated, how do you do it? So let me kind of hear from you. Um, we'll do a vo voice vote here, but there's, you know, the two choices, fourth choice, use a curriculum to teach skills or provide conditions for youth to learn real world skills. Um, how many people orally would vote for A? Nobody? For B? Uh, okay, <laughs> you're with me. Now, we, we haven't um, actually tested A, and I, you know, teaching can be really important, um, but uh, we just have a lot of data that supports B, and it goes along with what Ben Franklin said a long time ago. Uh, social emotional learning is practical knowledge, and we know that you can't teach practical knowledge entirely in the classroom or on the internet. You gotta have real world experience because it's so nuanced and it involves things that happen you just can't learn um, from a book. Um, and um, so when we ask youth how they learned, um, they said, you know, they taught themselves. They learned from experience. They learned from things that happened in the program um, and part of it is they use some of those new adolescent skills for analysis, comparison, uh, critical reflection, um, and uh, I'm gonna skip over that, but um, it gets us to the question, well, what's the role of leaders then? If kids kind of see it is their learning, their experiential learning, where does staff come in? And we're gonna talk about two different things. First is program structures. Um, activities, sequences of activities, youth roles, cycles of learning, um, and along with structures, um, culture kind of goes with that. You know, within this program, we have built in a built in biome of kind of ways of doing things, try, try again in our program, you know, or being open to talk about SES skills as well as attitudes and values. Um, and we are gonna talk about this in terms of kind of three braids there with youth active learning in the middle, but then program structures and staff supports playing a critical role in all weaving together to make that learning happen. But that learning is different for different domains. So I'm gonna kind of quickly talk about responsibility development and we'll shift to other domains uh, later. So, um, we talk about Rosa, we're gonna tell a story about Rosa and roles and how she learned responsibility. Um, so um, let me just talk about responsibility a little bit. Responsibility is also one of those vital 21st century things. Um, it's valued across culture. It's associated with all these good things. And if you think about adult life, think about your life, it's all about roles or it's a lot about roles. Your job, your family roles. Um, to be an adult, you need to be able to, to do roles. And um, uh, the way kids used to learn roles was through chores, but the number of chores assigned to kids has been decreasing by a half a chore every decade for a long time. And in many homes now, in American homes, there's no chores at all. And part of the reason is that American parents don't like the word duty, it's become kind of a dirty word, at least in a lot of households, and we think kids need to learn self-motivation and have choices. Um, so, turns out programs can be a really good context because kids have made choices to be there for them to learn responsibility. Um, and, um, We found that uh, roles, so let me just do, roles were really important. Um, you know, when we think of roles, we think on the one hand, it's a set of obligations, expectations, and goals, but it also comes with powers. 
to do it. You're, you're legitimized to do what needs to be done, obviously within constraints. And so keep that in mind. Here's just some rules across programs. Kids have lots of different kinds of rules. Um, you know, this is just a beginning list. A lot of times kids are assigned or choose roles. Sometimes uh, program leaders help kids make roles. Um, and so those are the structures. And so let's go to uh, Rosa and her program, um, which was called, which we're calling, um, the beat goes on. And so that had a culture, which is a culture of high expectations and accountability. Um, they did a project, they created a magazine called Vision 411, and they had rules. Rosa was the editor in chief, um, others were writers, and the adult leader's role was to be the leader, uh, Vivian. And so Rosa was a kind of self effacing 16 year old Latina. She'd been in the youth organization for several years and served on the youth council. She joined BEAT because she wanted to be a forensic investigator and learned to use cameras and computers. And when Vivian was asked to take the role, this is why she, why she took it. Watching my older peers on the youth council throwing parties, I wanted to do that. I wanted to show I can do stuff like that. So this is important. Rosa wanted the role, and in her study, two-thirds of our youth felt they wanted the role, and nearly all youth said they were invested. Um, other youth at, at uh, the program took on roles as reporters, writers, copy editors, and all these roles came with demanding expectations. So this is step one. Youth voluntarily took on demanding obligations. Step two then is, and maybe you've had this experience where you take on a role, okay? Say, oh, I can do that. But then the role grows, right? And there's stuff comes out of the woodwork, and oh my God, I had no idea I was getting into all this. Well, for use, it's the first time they've had that experience. And Rosa reported that all of her kids were like kind of overwhelmed. Um, so Damien is supposed to email people, but then people didn't respond. John's role is like, oh, being a reporter, you gotta handle bias, and I gotta balance their biases and my biases. Maria was on this team, and the two other people on the team were like going at it and had totally different ideas, and she had the role of trying to navigate that. Um, so Rosa, in turn, said, um, well, almost my whole group was like this. It's a lot harder than they thought it would be. And she then felt her job, too, was a lot harder than it, than it had been. Um, she said, in my head's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, no. But she'd had a lot of experience taking care of her three younger siblings. And um, this was more kids to take care of, but um, she was also concerned it would make her look really bad if she messed up. So step three was that these youth, despite the strain, persevered. They kept going um, for a number of reasons. Rosa was kind of came from within the self. I'm just not a quitter. Um, it partly came from her family. Um, the biggest reason was that uh, solidarity with the peers. Um, you know, that, okay, I'm, I'm obligated. I'm, that team is there. I'm obligated to that team. Uh, the other one, and I'll wait with that, is leaders' high expectations. So as a result of this, the magazine was completed, and um, youth felt a real change in who they were after taking on that role. Um, you know, they felt more grown up, they felt more responsible, um, and Rosa, and this is really key, she said, um, I saw myself as a very responsible person. I thought I could be trusted with a lot of things and it made me want to stay that way. A lot of kids said that. I want to have this experience again. And they started doing it at home. They started doing it in their schoolwork. Uh, the program learning transferred to other contexts. Um, and even the parents we talked to um, said that their kids were volunteering at home or working harder on their homework as a re result of this. OK, I'm going to skip ahead to um, the staff supports. 
So just to review a little bit, we have talked about how the program culture really created structures, they created um, uh, roles, they created staff support for each of these different stages leading to the learning. So the structure of high expectations was there. And the staff's ongoing role, then coming up from the bottom, and notice these are two-way arrows, was to help the process along. And they did a lot of things, again, I can't list them all. Partly they matched youth to the um, expectations, trying to get roles that they were interested in, um, that they could do. Um, they also then provided ongoing supports. They cultivated that peer culture. And they did this balancing act, which has always fascinated us, of balancing high expectations with providing supports. And I have um, a lot of good quotes about all of the youth saying, you know, she was there when I needed her. You know, uh, uh, well, let me start with the high expectation. Dahlia said, uh, Vivian's high expectation pushes me to get things done. It's like a motivation. If she, if she didn't have expectations, I wouldn't care. Rosa said, you know, she wants things perfect, and I've pictured myself as Vivian and asked, what would she say about this Photoshop drawing? Um, youth in programs are often doing a kind of project they've never done before. They're going into the unknown, and there's a, we find a lot of moments of doubt in kids' experiences, um, but youth were invested because, and they trusted the leaders, and because they trusted the leaders, they knew the leader wouldn't give them anything to do that they couldn't do. Um, uh, so Rosa said, she never asked me to do something we can't do, so that even though they didn't know how the hell they were gonna do it, they knew that since the leader asked them, they would be able to do it. Um, and I'm on my last page. <laughs> um, so at the same time, they provided various kinds of supports. Vivian said, um, she, I, I know, I watch, I observe. Um, Rosa, she's always there to help. Um, they, she provides coaching, teaching. Um, and he, she did a lot of, and I think this is another well-kept secret, um, she did a lot of reminding and prodding and all the good programs we studied, that happens quite a bit. It's like, okay, there's deadlines coming up, I'll remember this, so phone calls, uh, that's not uh, widely known, I think, but it's a key part we find across this. And so Vivian had an expertise that we've described as the art of restraint. She did everything she could to maximize youth's agency and freedom in their work so they could learn from experience. But she was skilled at providing just the right amount of structure and support when it was needed to keep that learning process going forward. So, and then a final step in um, the process, of course, was the reflection and the celebration at the end. Um, so I'm gonna end with that reflection and celebration and pass this over to Natalie to talk about emotions and more about um, the leader's role.